brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Hello, my friend. My name is Duke Duvall. Welcome to another segment of Conquering Your Giants. When we get together week after week, we look at the Word of God with the express view of being more fruitful. In other words, conquering the giants that would assail us, that would keep us from having all that God intends for us. And three weeks ago, I intended a single program on the concept of joy unspeakable. And it has continued now to where we conclude today in the fourth week. If you have not gone back and heard the other programs, I would encourage you to go to WTJR's website. They archive recent programs that are produced here locally at the Quincy Studio. And one of the things that I have found in 30 plus years of ministry is that there are a lot of people who love Jesus, but who are not really experiencing the fullness of joy. And certainly all of us are a work in progress and all of us experience joy in Jesus Christ to varying degrees, even in our own walk. Because some days we simply feel better in these physical bodies. And people who have chronic pain have told me that it's very difficult at times to really focus on the things that they know in their spirit man they really want to focus on. And so that's why I've said to you, we will in fact experience the fullness of joy. And we will know a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. Think about that. My precious 95-year-old mother and I, we talk about this. And we say, think about this one fact. This Jesus Christ that we have worshipped throughout our lives since we first were born again, we get to meet him face to face. My friend, chew on that for a moment. You know, it's kind of like if you were getting to meet some famous person. It would be exciting. Maybe it was somebody that you had heard about or somebody was coming to your area and you got backstage passes at the concert. What if you got to go to the governor's mansion for a luncheon in your state? Maybe you didn't even vote for the governor, but you get the point. Being there in the governor's mansion, being invited to the table there with dignitaries, it would be an exciting time. It would be something that could, in fact, be talked about and be shared, and it would be something that you would remember. Well, my friend, far greater than meeting any famous person or a dignitary or even being invited to meet the Queen of England, you and I, one day, will meet the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That is, if you know him by faith first. Jesus said, you must be born again. And in that interchange with Nicodemus, he said, if you're not born again, you will not see heaven. Plain and simple. Now you can say, I don't believe that. But what good does that do you? He's the creator. He's the one that sets the rules. What would you say if God said to you, let's say in a dream, this very night, what right, legally speaking, what right do you have to enter into my heaven? It's not your heaven. It's not my heaven. You ask most people in a survey at the store, do you believe there's a heaven? Yeah, I believe that there's heaven. The majority of people do believe in heaven, by the way. The, the uh, research shows that. In fact, interestingly enough, far more believe in heaven than believe in hell because they don't want to believe in hell. How can you believe in one and not the other when Jesus preached on both? In fact, he preached more about hell than he did heaven. But that's just us. We don't want to think that there is a judgment day coming. We don't want to think that 
we will not be in heaven when this life is over. But you see, there is to be a race of people that will exalt the Lord Jesus Christ forever and forever and forever. Somebody has said that God the Father beams His perfect love to God the Son, and God the Son beams His perfect love to God the Father, and you and I get caught in the crossfire. <laughs> what a beautiful word picture. But my friend, there are people that love God. It's been my experience. 30 plus years of ministry, I've had the chance, by God's grace, of preaching all over the world. And I've met brothers and sisters in Christ who, in listening to the testimony of their lives, are born again. And yet they're living an existence that seems to go against everything that you would think a believer should be experiencing in the fullness of God. I don't think that any one of us has the actual answer. Of course, we go through the scriptures and we see some of the principles involved. Now remember, when I start reading you something here, I shared this on another program years ago when we were talking about witnessing and we were talking about the importance of allowing those who are lost to at least be confronted with the reality that a day of judgment is coming. You and I, if we love somebody, we'll tell them the truth. And I think maybe the example that I used on that program was if you had a cure for cancer. It was an absolutely proven cure for cancer. You've tried it on a hundred people. They had different kinds of cancer. They drank this little drink that you concocted in your laboratory and got approved by FDA. And now then, 100 out of 100 have been cured of cancer. How would that change your life? You're on an airplane flight and you happen to be sitting next to a couple and the woman is weeping. And you can't help but over here because you're sitting right there by her that she's headed to the Cancer Institute and they've not given her any hope. Would you stay silent in that plane ride? Or would you say to her, I'm sorry I couldn't help but over here and I realize it's none of my business, but there is a cure and you don't have to die of cancer. We're all going to die, but you don't have to die of cancer. My friend, you and I have a cure for spiritual cancer. How does that affect your life? Because you see, People who really want to experience the joy of the Lord. And that's been our subject now. We're in our fourth program talking about joy unspeakable. But Jesus gives us principles. For example, he says, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men to me. Now that's one of the biggest ifs I find in the Bible. Because most people who profess Jesus do not express him and lift him up to other people. The research is very clear on that. If you are a professing Christian, you are saying, I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. Yes, Duke, I'm born again. Then I know that of 100 of you that say that, only three of you, based upon research, Barna research, the numbers are clear, doesn't matter whether you're Mennonite or Methodist, doesn't matter whether you're Anglican or Amish, across the board denominationally, Presbyterians and Baptists, you can look at professing Christians across the ranks and three out of every 100 professing followers of Christ, three actively share their faith in Jesus Christ with other people. Now, my friend, what's wrong with that picture? When I was speaking to a group of Christian businessmen, I said to them, tell me the truth. If you got $1,000 
automatically wired into your bank account. Every time you shared your faith in Christ with another human being, whether they accepted Christ or not, you get $1,000. And so that day you went and you shared your faith in Christ with seven other people. And you got home that night and you checked your bank balance. Sure enough, there was $1,000 deposits. There were seven $1,000 deposits that were not there when you left that morning. I said to these businessmen, if you became convinced that every time you shared your faith, $1,000 was deposited into your bank account at your local bank, tell me the truth. How many of you would very likely be sharing your faith more often? And every hand in that place went up. And then I asked him the question, why would you do for $1,000 what we ought to be doing for a reward in heaven that could not even be compared in value. But of course I'm asking you the same question. Because I can tell you, and I'm ashamed, but thankfully it's under the blood of Jesus Christ, there was a time when I had a relationship with Jesus Christ. As a teenager, I knew that I needed a savior. And I was saved. And I loved God, and it was meaningful for me to be a part of that youth group and, and to be presented at a younger age even than that, my first Bible, and I can remember that. But as I was on a track toward playing pro ball, that's what I thought, and went on to play at the University of Alabama for four years and was thinking about playing in the minor leagues and pros, just like a lot of people think about that growing up what their game plan for life is. Thankfully, God had a different plan. But I can remember not wanting to rock the boat. I can remember not wanting to make waves and upsetting people. And so I kept this Jesus to myself. My friend, you can't have it both ways. I've married a lot of couples in 30 plus years of, of ministry. And I've never married a couple where they came to me and said, would you do this in secret? Because I really don't want people to know that I'm married to him. I mean, it's just automatic, especially among young couples. So in love. Oh, they think that he's Prince Charming and she's the princess. And, and they're telling everybody. How can you and I have a love relationship with the King of Kings? be taken out of hell into heaven, be adopted as a commoner into the royal family, and be ashamed to tell anybody that. Well, this is what I shared on a recent uh, speaking engagement, and it's something that came back to my attention, something that I had shared years ago on one of the programs. might be familiar to you. But a woman named Louise had a dream. And she dreamt that a ghoulish, ghost-like figure came out of a local cemetery in this little town where she lived. And I submit to you, if you had this same dream, it would get your attention too. This ghost-like figure in Louise's dream came floating down Main Street and turned at her house right up the sidewalk through the front door without the door ever opening, floated up the stairs to the second floor, into her bedroom where she was sleeping and presented her with an envelope. And on the front of the envelope, it was simply marked from someone in hell. Louise would later tell a friend of hers, this dream was so real to me that when I woke out of that dream, not only was I weeping and shaking, but I actually thought I could smell sulfur, brimstone, like this letter really had come from hell. That's how real the dream was to me. Well, in her dream, she, with shaking hands, rips open this envelope marked from someone in hell. And she begins to read. And here in this letter, it says, my friend, I'm here in hell right now. And feel that you're to blame somehow. On earth I walked with you day by day, but never did you point the way. 
Oh, you knew the Lord in truth and glory, but never did you tell me his story. My knowledge then was very dim. You could have led me safe to him. And though we lived together on the earth, you never told me of your second birth. And now I'm here in hell condemned, and I think it's because you failed to mention him. Oh, you taught me many things, that's true. I called you my friend, and you know what? I trusted you. But I learn now that it's too late, and you could have kept me from this fate. We walked by day, and we talked by night, and yet you showed me not God's light. You let me live and love and die, knowing that I would never live on high. Yes, I called you a friend in life, and I trusted you through joy and strife. And yet on coming to this hellish end, I see that you were not my friend. And it was signed by a woman named Marcia. And Louise knew somebody named Marcia. Well, she woke from this dream. She was shaking, trembling, crying profusely, feeling like she was actually smelling a smell from hell. And she rolled out of her bed onto her knees and she began to, to repent. In her weeping, she began to cry out to God, Please forgive me. I have been ashamed of the gospel. Now, my friend, I want to just tell you again, we're talking about the subject of joy. You heard this before on a program that I did here on salvation and sharing your faith. But I'm talking to you about joy, but you'll see here in just a moment how intricately they're connected. I was in that same position years ago as a young Christian, somewhere around my senior year of college. And I began to see things differently by God's grace. And that's how you'll see it. Not because your brother Duke is conveying it to you, but because you will go before God and you'll ask him, is what my brother's saying true? Is it something you're saying to me personally? And he will convey to you what the scriptures say. Let the redeemed of the Lord do what? Say so. He, she who wins souls is wise. My friend, you and I have been called to be the light of the world. I mentioned that earlier in another program that John 8 became the first foundational truth as we were selecting a name for our ministry 27 years ago. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And I noticed in that very next chapter, John 9, Jesus said, while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And in Matthew 5, he says, now then you, you're the light of the world. My friend, you and I will never have the joy of the Lord unless we do the Lord's work the way that he's designed and intended. We can know him we can love Him, and we can get to heaven because of Him and still live a stunted growth in this life, devoid of most of the joy He wants us to have. I'll finish this story in just a moment, but I want to look at the Scripture. I want you to see this on the screen as it relates to joy. Take a look. My brethren, count it all joy. There's that J-O-Y, Jesus, others, yourself. That's the formula. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Last week we said that could be translated from the original Greek, trials. So my friend, if you're going through great temptations right now, you're going through trials, and maybe you didn't even realize you had one until I just mentioned to you that if you're not letting the redeemed of the Lord say so, you're being tried right now. If you're ashamed of the gospel, Jesus said, I will be ashamed of you in front of my Father in heaven. That's a problem. Now then, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, verse 4, 
But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect. That word could be translated mature and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. And then let's go to the next verse. From John 16, 24. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive. And your joy will be complete. Keep looking at it just for a minute. My friend, I'm sure that somewhere in your walk with Christ, you have asked for healing. That's good that we understand that he is Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Perhaps you have asked him to supply your needs for you and your family. He wants us to do that. He wants us to know him as Jehovah Jireh. But have you asked him to be the proclaimer of the gospel message through you? He is the ultimate evangelist. He is the ultimate conveyor of good news. And he says, until now, you've not asked for that in my name. My friend, are you willing to say, Lord Jesus, will you please give me a boldness that the redeemed of the Lord, me, that I would say so. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you, please, I do not want to be ashamed of you and the gospel. I don't want to be more concerned with my reputation than with your reputation. And so you tell me, Lord, ask and I'm going to receive it. And in it, my joy is going to be complete. Now, my friend, I want to bring this home to you. In Louise's case, she rolled out of bed and she began to repent. And I did that too as a young man. Heavenly Father, whatever reasons I haven't been sharing the gospel, I repent of that. And I ask you, please, to give me, Duke, give me a boldness. Help me to understand that the ultimate act of love in this world would be to reconcile a lost person to God that they might be brought to life too. I asked you earlier, could you sit next to a couple and she's weeping because she has cancer when you had in your own pocket a cure for cancer? Wouldn't you do whatever you could in love to try to get her to try this cure for cancer? Wouldn't you reason with her as the scriptures say to do? Sit down and let us reason together. Wouldn't you try to persuade her as Paul uses that word? Wouldn't you want to be winsome to win some to Christ? Wouldn't you do in that set of circumstances there whatever you could? Maybe if you had several vials there, you would drink one of them yourself to prove to her it's not harmful. Maybe you would show her a list of people that have written to you that were cured of that cancer because they drank this concoction. I'm just using an analogy, but you see my point. That's what we do. We reason together. We reason with people. Can we save anyone? No. When I went into ministry 33 years ago, a wise minister told me, remember when you preach or when you convey one-on-one -on -one with somebody else the good news of Jesus Christ. He was talking to me as a young minister. He said, remember this. In sharing your faith in sharing with people about salvation and heaven. God has never called you to be successful in that exchange. He's just called you to be faithful. And I want to say that to you. When you do the hard part of proclaiming the good news, and it is hard, it'll get easier as you practice, as you do it more, as you see people come from darkness into light as you see people who are spiritually dead begin to take on the glow of life it will motivate you it will encourage you and as you experience the joy of obedience you'll want to do it more God designed it that way 
He says, if you're going to please me, you've got to believe that I am. And that I am a rewarder of those who diligently seek me. And my friend, diligently seeking him means obedience. And this is an area where many, most Christians are disobedient. They are not letting the redeemed of the Lord say so. They're not winning souls to Christ. And today so many churches are talking about their seating capacity. Bragging on how many seats are in the auditorium. My friend, listen, we ought not to be talking about the seating capacity, but the sending capacity. The gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. Louise had great intentions when she got off of her knees, repenting unto God. Forgive me, Lord, for being ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It stops today, she said. I'm going to call Marcia first thing in the morning. And from this day forward, I will be vocal in my sharing my faith, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so at 8 o'clock that next morning, where she'd been repenting at 2 in the morning, she now calls and Marcia's husband, Bob, picks up the phone. Hello. Uh, hi, Bob. This is Louise. I hope I'm not calling too early. I need to speak to Marcia. It's very important. There was just silence. Bob said, Louise, apparently you haven't heard. Heard what, Bob? Marcia was killed in a head-on collision last night. My friend, that happens every day. That someone you and I have influence with, they step from time into eternity. And if they die in their sins, they are in hell right now. And they will be when we have sung for 10,000 years and our future is just beginning in heaven. They will have been in hell. And there's no joy in that. As I pray in closing right now, please take to heart, your joy is tied to Jesus Christ. Obedience to Him and sharing Him with others. Heavenly Father, may it be so. I ask it in Jesus' name that you would give us the joy unspeakable and full of glory as we are your ambassadors in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Contact Duke Duvall in care of WTJR TV 16, 222 North 6th Street in Quincy, Illinois, 62301. Or go to Duke's website at www.dukeduvall.com. Be sure and join us next week for Conquering Your Giants.